Welcome to a short stop with a short stop. Today we're going to talk a little bit about drugs and alcohol. Every single year for the 15 years that I played, the FBI would come to our spring training. And they would talk to us about uh, gambling, about the mafia, about people who are out there always trying to want to entice a baseball player into throwing a game so that they could bet money on it and win a lot of money themselves. There were drug dealers out there that were wanting to get baseball players enticed in drugs so that they could get an, another money base and start selling to them and be able to make more money. Uh, but the FBI would come in and they would talk to us for about an hour. It was always very interesting, the things that they told us. But let me give you a few stories about exactly some of the things that I saw happen. One year, we always flew charter flights. <clears throat> we didn't know it, but the FBI were disguised as stewards and stewardesses on our flights because we had uh, somebody on our team that was actually using the drugs, but not only using them, but selling them themselves. And this person uh, ended up getting caught. And our phones were being tapped, and we didn't know it. But this person was using cocaine so bad that, uh, and he was making probably over a million dollars a year. But the money that he was making didn't suffice his habit that he had, that he had to start selling it to be able to make enough money to be able to use it himself. He ended up spending a year in jail. It destroyed him mentally. It destroyed him physically. Uh, it destroyed him as financially. And it ended his baseball career. But that's just one story. There's another one. One night we were in San Diego, and about 4 o'clock in the morning, we heard this most blood-curdling scream that you have ever heard in your life. And most of us were staying on the same floor. And all of a sudden, when that scream happens, you just see doors opening. <clears throat> we walked down to the other. We knew who, who was in that room. We finally got the door open, and the young man that was in there was hallucinating. He had been up on cocaine for three days without any sleep. And he thought that there were snakes coming out of the floor, out of the walls, out of the ceiling. They finally got him some medical help. But lo and behold, that young man never pitched one more inning in the big leagues. It destroyed him. Absolutely, teetotally destroyed him. We were in Houston at the Astrodome. Our starting pitcher that night got KO'd in the first inning. They scored like seven runs off of him. Our manager had to take him out. And he he had literally he pitched in the World Series at one time. He was a great pitcher. But after the game, we'd go back and look in front of his locker, and there was five empty beer cans. We said, uh-oh, he's in trouble. So we went out on the town and started looking for him in some of the places we thought he might be. But we couldn't find him. But we're staying in a place called the Shamrock Hilton. And it was literally the swimming pool that they had there. The University of Houston used it for all their swim meets. It had the three-meter springboard. It had the 10-meter the platforming uh, diving where they dove, dove off it, plus the Olympic-sized pool. And we were coming in, walking by this pool, going, getting ready to go back to our room. And all of a sudden, we hear laughter. And we look up on that 10-meter platform diving board <clears throat> and there's the guy that we were looking for he was up there saying look i'm going to do a triple lindy some of y'all may know what a triple lindy is if, if you don't look it up on google it's, it's one of the greatest dives you'll ever see but what this man did not know was there was no water in the swimming pool and he was just as drunk as he could possibly be and it took us at least a half an hour to talk him into understanding 
that there was no water in the pool. And we finally climbed up there to where he was at. <clears throat> one of us went before him, one after, but we got him back down. But his life could have ended right there because in the bottom of that pool, it was nothing but concrete. And that pool was about 20 feet deep, not including the 10 meters that he was up above the pool, but another 20 feet that he would have dropped if he, if he would have went off that diving board. Alcohol is a mind-altering drug, and it will do funny things to you. It, is, it can change your personality. It can make you say things that you don't mean. It can make you do things that you don't want to do. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 35 reads as follows. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? who has redness of eyes, those who linger over the wine, those who go to the taste of mixed wine. Do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your mind will utter perverse things, and you will be like one who lies down in the middle of the sea, or like one who lies in the top of a mast. They struck me, but I did not become ill. They beat me, but I did not know it. When shall I awake? I will seek another drink. That is what alcohol will do to you. It will make you see funny things, and it will make you do funny things. Alcohol is a mind-altering drug. So is cocaine, so is heroin, so is all the other drugs that are out there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not let anything be a master of me. Alcohol and cocaine and heroin, fentanyl, all these drugs will become a master of you if you let them because they're all addicting. And if you let them become a master of you, you've sinned. Uh, it's not only that, but what it will do to you physically, what it will do to you mentally, what it will do to you financially, but most of all, what it will do to you spiritually. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, and I think this says it all right here. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sexuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, of which I forewarned you, just as I, I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That should stick in your mind like glue. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if we let something be a master of us, particularly drugs and alcohol. I just for first become a Christian, and we were in Cincinnati. And I, you know, when I was in Cincinnati, I had to leave a lot of tickets because I had a lot of family and friends that came. So after the game one night, we go over to a restaurant, uh, and it was actually out on the Ohio River. It was a boat, and we were sitting there eating. I had probably about 15 or 20 of my family members with me. And all of a sudden, the maitre d' comes over with the white towel over his arm, <clears throat> and he's got a bottle of wine there. And he says, Davy Concepcion has sent this over here to you. And I said, oh my goodness. Just before that, I had told that day when we played before the game, I had a bat boy go over and get Davy Concepcion to sign a ball for me. And, and he did. And now he's sending me a bottle of wine. You want to talk about peer pressure? That is peer pressure. Every single eye at that table of my family is looking at, what's he going to do now? He says he's a Christian. What's he going to do? Well, lo and behold, I told the matron, I said, send it back. I said, send it. But I had to talk to Davey the next day and tell him why I didn't accept it and try to explain it to him. But there's going to be peer pressure out there in your life. People are going to ask you to do things that you know that are not right. 
but how are you going to handle it? But here's the thing that I want you to understand. There were eight people at that table that were not New Testament Christians. And it took about 20 years. But those eight people are now New Testament Christians. Now, I'm not saying it was because I refused a bottle of wine. I think it was one of the reasons they saw an example of somebody trying to do the right thing. Stay away from alcohol, stay away from drugs. Get high on Jesus. Thank you again for being with a shortstop with a shortstop. Oh.